This is a quick overview of chapter two, talking about particularly the internal environment and organizational culture. There are three different types of environments that we've been working through the last couple of weeks, and this section in particular has to do with the internal environment, and those are the factors that affect the organization's performance with inside its boundaries, things that you have control over. So that's what this section is going to be focused on. There's a tiny bit about the external environment, and then the global environment is more focused on Chapter 3. There are a couple of different internal environmental factors. Some we'll spend more time talking about and some less. So the first one is thinking about what the mission of an organization is. So this obviously is in the control of the organization unless you've been handed your mission um, from say a governmental agency. But in most situations, you as an organization get to decide what is our reason for being here? What's our purpose? And then that effectively guides everything else that you do. Uh, and should, and good organizations or solid organizations will have a good match between what they've decided their purpose is and then any other decision that they go and make. So for example, um, Meyer Gardens, their mission is to promote the enjoyment, understanding, and appreciation of gardens, sculpture, the natural environment, and the art. So everything that they do should have a strong connection um, to one of those items that's listed in their mission and they do they do a great job of staying focused on what they what their reason for existence is a couple of the other environmental factors internally um, is management and culture so we're going to spend some time talking about organizational culture but management you get to decide who's in charge and that makes a difference uh, the resources that you have, you have control over your human resources, which is your employees, your informational resources, what information do you um, have, and that has to do mainly with technology, what technology is available for you to use, financial, which is our funding, and then the actual physical resources that you decide um, that you have and how you manage those. There's structure, which we'll be talking about later in the semester, thinking about how you put your organization together. And then there's also systems, which is the process that you turn your inputs into outputs, and uh, you have control over how that happens. But we're going to spend time talking about organizational culture. So I just want to hit up on a couple of points uh, related to how this works and then one model to help us analyze culture. So organizational culture are those values, beliefs, actions, stories, artifacts, and assumptions uh, about how we act, how we behave, that members of an organization share. And um, I think some of the interesting things about organizational culture is that um, whenever people kind of get together in sort of organized way, uh, culture develops. Um, and it's interesting to be able, I think it's fascinating to, to look at the outward implications of that culture. So you can walk into any sort of organization and see uh, what's on the walls, how people work, how they interact, uh, what does their office space look like, um, how they run meetings, and all those observable artifacts can help give us clues to what that culture is like. Uh, culture develops no matter what you do. And so you might even have sub subcultures that develop throughout an organization. And so if you're not intentional about directing it in the way that you think is appropriate or that matches your mission and vision, um, you may have some perhaps dysfunctional ways that your culture is developing. And those subcultures may emerge. There are plenty of different elements of culture. Uh, I'm just going to hit on a few of them. When we think about the things that we can see, the, those elements of culture help us identify what that is and how, how we um, can describe it then to maybe new employees coming in. Hey, this is what our organizational culture looks like. The first one is heroes, and heroes are people within a culture that are 
seen as role models because maybe they personify or embody those values that are held by an organization. So uh, many times founders of organizations will take that title of a hero. I would say here at Cornerstone, uh, Dr. Stoll is definitely one of our heroes. Some would say Chip Huber or um, perhaps Gerald Longjohn or some of the coaches around campus. Um, so those are the individuals that say this, you know, you are Cornerstone. You, we can see the elements of Cornerstone in you, or they've had some um, element of being part of the way that the organization has been successful. Uh, we can also tell stories, and these are stories that say this is what we value about our organization, um, and then they get retold over and over again. I know at my husband's firm, they they talk a lot about when the firm started and just what they had to do to kind of get it off the ground and having to go buy desks to be, and you know file cabinets and just that. They talk about themselves as a startup. Like those are the stories that they tell, even though they're much farther down the road and pretty well established. Now they go back and they tell those stories about what it was like those first couple of years to kind of really get going. Uh, slogans are what you would think they are. They're just uh, phrases that help identify uh, organizations. Um, they get people on the same page with hopefully they all have the same understanding of the meaning of that slogan. So just even um, building lives that matter here at Cornerstone, just that simple slogan can tie everyone together a little bit and say we all kind of know what that means. Um, symbols are everything that you observe. It can be anything to plaques and pins and wall hangings and jackets, how you talk, all those things that demonstrate meaning and that can be physical objects or how we speak to each other. Um, when I worked at Fifth Third for a while, like everyone had to wear a Fifth Third pin and it's not a huge deal to wear this little pin on your lapel, but it does have a identifying factor to everyone that you would see walking around that had that pin. So it was an immediately recognizable element of their culture. And then lastly, we have ceremonies, and that could be something as simple as everyone getting coffee at the same time, eating at the same lunch table, um, to how we celebrate birthdays, to um, conferences, you know, here at Cornerstone, we've got convocation, we've got graduation, we've got candle lights, and we've got uh, midnight madness and all those things that become part of our culture. So we have a cultural model. It's called the Onion Model by Shine, C-H-E-I-N. And we can look at three different levels to help identify whether organization culture is strong or weak. So I'm going to walk through each one of these levels and then how we can analyze that. So our first level is looking at those artifacts or behavior, uh, what we just went through, those five different elements of culture. So this is the things that you see, the things that people say, that physical and social environment. So I might walk into an office building. Maybe they have some of those cheesy motivational posters on the wall. Maybe they have offices where the doors are always closed. Maybe they have a lunchroom where everyone meets together and has lunch together every day in that lunchroom. Um, maybe they have a ping pong table in their office. All of those things are things that we can identify as elements of that organization's culture. It can also be how you talk to each other. Let's just um, picture I'm walking down the hallway and I see another professor. I could say, hello, professor. And I could mean, and you maybe observe that observation. You say, oh, look, you know, maybe Professor Hammond really respects that other person. Well, that's one way you could interpret that, but you could also interpret it that I could also be saying that I'm being kind of sarcastic and silly about it and and not being respectful. So there's different ways that you can interpret. There's often multiple meanings to certain things or long-term reasons, historical reasons why things are the way that they are. And that can, can be really fascinating to kind of dig into that. The second level is our values. And when we think about a value, we all know what values are. They're those guiding principles that guide our behavior. They're those underlying things that say, because I value community, I'm going to make different decisions. Or because I value family, I'm going to make 
specific decisions. Well, organizations have those too, and those show themselves very in very, very noticeable ways, um, some more than others. So if an organization says that they value hard work, that might translate into the observable artifacts of people working on weekends or working late or working through lunch. Um, or giving bonuses for productivity. So you could see where some of those value statements could then become part of that organizational culture that can be observed. So what is important to see, we want to see if the behaviors match those values to see if they're real cultural elements or if they're just aspirations. Because if I said that a value of our organization is innovation, but the suggestion box on the wall is broken and the suggestions inside are from like 1992 and no one's ever looked at them. I don't know if that observation really matches the value. So they might say we value innovation, but our behavior does not really bear it out. So we want to see that there's a strong match. The inside level of the model is looking at are assumptions and these are those core assumptions about the world and as an organization we typically take those for granted um, we would say these are unquestionably true it's the way the world works they're really hard to articulate because it's just the way that we are that's just who we are this is who we are this is why we exist um, but it does need to continue to match the other levels to make for a strong culture so what I like to do if I look at my example um, of looking at how we might connect these. Um, so let's work through this. It might make sense. So level one says the things I observe were a relaxed atmosphere, an idea bonus, and suggestion boxes. Okay, so those are a couple of things that I observed. The second level, I would say, okay, what's the value I could connect to that? Well, innovation. I, we value innovation, and those are the things that we can see to that. So the third, that assumption level, what I like to do is just to ask why. Why do we value innovation? And if I can answer that question, that's typically the assumption. So in this situation, um, innovation is the value. And I say, why? Why do we value innovation? And we might say, well, it's because change is good. And we, in the bottom of our hearts, believe that change is good. And because we do, that results in these other things happening. And if we can see a strong connection all the way through, we um, are going to have a strong culture. Now, we um, let's think of another example. I'll just think it through for Cornerstone. So if I said some of the behaviors that I can recognize are required chapels, maybe small group Bible studies, spiritual formation, prayer in class, like that whole category of that, I might say that we value spiritual growth as an organization, as a school, as a university. We value spiritual growth. Well, why? Why do we value spiritual growth? And for me, that answer might be is that we would say faith is just as important, if not more, than academics. And that's why we put such a high value on it. And that becomes the core assumption that we are going to do these things. We're going to gather in chapel. We're going to pursue our relationship with God in different contexts because we believe it's important. So I think that's where we can start to see, okay, is that culture strong or not? Or are there things, forces speaking into that that are trying to disrupt that organizational culture? So um, what when we're looking at analyzing this, and you might see a question on the exam about this, I would say, okay, think through a slice of that onion. How can you um, dig down into an organization to identify an artifact or a related group of artifacts, the value that it ties to, and then the assumption? You could probably pull lots of different artifacts, right? So I would like you to be able to pull a narrow slice. So not everything about cornerstone and then tie it to the value and the assumption, which you could, that would be a very macro level. But on a micro level, we can do what's kind of one narrow slice of that culture and can I connect them between the behavior, the value, and the assumption. So real briefly with the external environmental factors, um, we 
are going to spend more time talking about this with strategic planning. So we'll um, see these again. <laughs> but this is anything that impacts the organization from outside. You can't ignore them, though because they do have an impact on your level of performance as an organization. So if I look at customers, for example, if they change their tastes, um, they want better quality, they have impact on how we do our, do our thing, do, do, produce our product or provide our service. So even, so I'm thinking here at Cornerstone, I mean, if we, our students are, we could consider them our customers for this example. So if they're our customer, what does that student need in their education? What do they want? Do they want um, more choices in what majors? Do they want double majors? Do they want three-year plans? And that maybe then changes the way we do our job a little bit or the different offerings that we provide. If we look at the labor force, um, you may have a decrease in the availability of your labor, labor force and that means that you have will have to pay a premium for the people that you do hire. I know here in um, West Michigan when we had our economic downturn many uh, individuals that worked in the construction industry left the state and now construction has picked up quite substantially especially uh, corporate uh, commercial uh, construction and they're having a really hard time finding people to work. And so just that simple change impacts how they hire, how much money they're spending for their hires, um, and how, they, how, how well they can perform. Uh, for technology, obviously this and society goes hand in hand of how quickly technology has changed and how it changes the way we communicate our expectations about organizations, um, what types of products that we want. I can't imagine that even 20 years ago anyone would realize how um, quickly everyone would want everything done and how technology would be able to meet those needs, but then there is just a tremendous pressure in organizations to keep up their human side of things with the, how fast technology moves. And that changes um, how we work, um, how much we ha call on our employees to work, whether that's working at home on weekends, just always being having to be available, it's just changed significantly. And then obviously, you know, the economy and the government changes in those have an impact on the external environment as well. So we're going to look briefly at some business ethics. I'm going to jump through a couple of these. Um, so business ethics, we can think through it organizationally, then also personally. So uh, an organization can have, um, they have organizational purposes. They can decide if their main purpose is going to maximize profits. And to some degree, organizations have to have that approach. Um, but as we have been talking about faith and work and thinking through what are some of the other purposes that we need to th consider where we're looking to create meaningful work for individuals, we're also looking for uh, ways to provide goods and services to help our communities to flourish. And how does that then resonate with our, the individuals in our, in our organizations and in our community? Organizations can um, typically will have a code of conduct, and a code of conduct will say, this is who we are, this is how we expect you to behave. So there's going to be hopefully a connection with that mission statement. If you're there, if you're missional in nature as an organization to say, we're here to provide um, help to others through our services, that will translate into uh, that code of conduct. And it will also be very specific. It'll have some policies in place as well for what you stand for and what you want your employees to do or not do. Um, there's also industry code of conduct. So if you're a sports management code of ethics, there's one that exists for that industry, human resource manager code of ethics, project manager code of ethics, like every kind of industry group has their own code of ethics that um, is available. It always needs to be enforced from the top down. There's examples all over the place of having um, CEOs that didn't and then the 
things that happened that were not good because of that. So that led to the um, use of whistleblowing programs where an individual would be protected for uncovering ethical lapses in an organization and they won't with the without worrying about whether they're going to lose their job. This is just a quick example of what Levi Strauss has as their ethical principles and this is just right out on their website so it's very open and they're honest about this is who we are and this is what we stand for and many more organizations have gone to doing this as well. Um, Whole Foods has a great um, like code of conduct, ethical principles that they, core values, I think is what they call it. And then this, um, then that leads or guides everything else that they do. Uh, we can also think about ethics from a personal point of view. Um, and our definition for ethics is standards of right and wrong that influence our behavior. And it's interesting thinking through how every culture and every country has, um, and advocates for an ethical way to live and sometimes um, there can be differences between the two. I have some friends that have done some business in China and what we would consider a bribe here in the United States they can they call a facility payment and so if you're going to do business in that part of the world you have to make some decisions on whether or not you're going to pay those facility payments because that's just the way that business gets done in China. I actually had a friend who was building a plant in China and he said I'm not going to pay them. If I'm going to go over and do this I'm not going to pay those facility payments and he took a lot of heat for it um, for kind of standing his ground to say that he decided that wasn't something he was willing to do. It did take him a little longer to get the job done, but I think that he gained a lot of respect from his colleagues um, for, you know, having a stance about what he believed was right and then sticking by it. We have a couple, I'm going to talk up just through a few ethical decision-making um, tests. So the first one is the four-way test, and this was developed by Rotary International, and their purpose is to promote ethical business practices in every society and nation, in every cultural and religious context. So they say in every business decision, in all we say, think, or do, we ask these four questions. Is it the truth? Is it fair? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? If they're not all solid yes, then maybe you need to reconsider your decision. So it's a nice way to kind of think through, okay, this decision I'm thinking about making, what's the impact? Okay, let me think through these questions. Can I answer yes? Yeah, okay, yeah. Then maybe I'm good to move forward. If not, well, maybe I need to go talk to someone or someone that I really trust to kind of process it with me. Or maybe I need to... Maybe I need to pop on my knees and pray about what I'm going to move forward and do. A couple other, I, I call these, you know, gut check methods. Um, the first one is the glad you asked method. And um, this is just a quick filter for business decisions, uh, especially from an ethical point of view. So if you made a decision and you're going along and that was your decision and then an investigative reporter showed up your, at your door and said, hey, listen, I need to talk to you about that decision you made. And you were able to say, sure, I'm so glad you asked. I'm really proud of that decision and what our organization is doing. Come on in. Everything is available to you. Or if you saw that investigative reporter coming and you started, you know, shoving things in garbage cans and trying to hide in the bathroom, well, maybe that's a different story. So it's a nice way to just think through, you know what, would I be proud to either, you know, tell anyone or to tell my stakeholders, which is the second approach, uh, would I be proud to tell them about the decisions that I've made? The last one that I have is a three-step checklist, and this helps to collect that relevant information regarding an action. So we have three questions that we can ask and um the first one is, did the actual action violate any laws? So obeying the laws in your best interest, obviously. Secondly, does the action violate company or professional standards? Uh, it may be legal, but violating the standards of business or your profession may impact your job security or personal certifications. So um, some industries are much more strict than this. You can get disbarred if you behave unethically in the legal environment, for example. Um, but in many cases, it could be um, you could be terminated or let go or 
or lots of different consequences if you violate those. And then lastly is even if those other two are fine, you still want to figure out how that action will impact other individuals or groups of people. And that will help you determine whether that action is ethical. And I like that last question especially because regardless of the other two, if there are significant negative implications for individuals involved in the situation, then that's something to consider. So just real quickly, this was just an example um, that we went through in class, thinking through um, exaggerating your work experience on a resume. Um, he was hired, he was doing really well at his job, and then his boss find out, found out. So when we think about, does the action violate any laws? No, it's not, unless you um, lied about a felony conviction or being terminated for dishonesty. Um, claiming that you complete a degree that you didn't. Um, there's been plenty of examples of individuals that said that they had received a degree and then they didn't, and that is terms for termination, especially if that's a requirement for the job. Um, but let's just say he didn't, none of those were there. It's not necessarily um, illegal. Does it violate professional standards? Well, at the time, he wasn't part of their company. And I would say that's generally something you shouldn't do, but you could probably say, well, that's kind of borderline. But when we think about who is affected by the action, well, Don, he got employment, but now he could be terminated. And if he stays, he could have some difficulty being promoted. Other applicants, uh, if they were more highly qualified, they lost out on an opportunity for their employment. Um, the company had some negative impact because now they maybe lost out on the actually appropriate person for the job, and now perhaps he, they, that Don is not maybe trusted. So I think that is challenging, thinking through um, whether that's ethical or not. And, you know, we had some discussion about should, if you were Don's boss, would you fire him? And there were some opinions on both sides, so it's kind of interesting to think through um, what perspective you might take. Just lastly, we have some justifications for unethical behavior. So I'll hit on a couple of these. The first one is displacement of responsibility, where we blame our behavior on someone else, aka my boss made me do it. Um, secondly, we have the diffusion of responsibility. That's if you're operating a group and the whole group behaves unethically, then you diffuse the responsibility for that unethical action. So everyone goes out for a business dinner and overspends, but you all overspend and you put it on a business credit card. So it's really not anyone's one responsibility because the whole group did it. Advantageous comparison would be where we process, com we compare ourselves to others that perhaps are behaving worse. So if I only take a long lunch once in a while, but the person who sits next to me takes a long lunch every day, then I'm going to look at that and say, well, at least I don't do it every day even though you're still perhaps still behaving unethically or not up to the standards that's been placed for you for the organization. We may disregard the consequences where we minimize the harm cost, where if we overcharge someone by 50 cents, is that really a big deal? If I take a pack of pens home from work, is that really a big deal? If I give my friends free ice cream at the ice cream shop that they don't pay for, is that really a big deal? And we start to rationalize our behavior. Uh, attribution of blame, we could say it was caused by someone else. You know, I'm, I'm as a parent, this happens a lot at my house. She made me do it. He hit me, so I had to hit her. That kind of comparing or someone else's fault. It's not my fault. It's someone else's fault. The customer treated bad, me badly, so I had to treat them badly back. And that um, can be a dangerous slope to go down. And then lastly, we can use euphemistic labeling, where it's just using nicer words for things that perhaps are not so nice. Um, so this is just a, a crazy quick overview of the organizational culture and then the business ethics portion of, uh, of this class. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, let me know.